So I've got the iPad which will uh, show me the questions that you, you want to ask. So feel free to put them in during the, the entire session. Anything that springs to mind, you do, do put them into, the, into your app and I'll, I'll, I'll catch them here. Uh, and then when we get to a point where I'm opening up for questions, I'll see uh, which ones you've liked the most as well. So if you like a question, it will raise it to the top of the list and, and give that more prominence. It's only fair to be, to be digital, I suppose, in the way that we, we do these things at this particular conference. So uh, this is the, the industry leaders panel discussion. Uh, I'm joined by a, a fabulous panel of industry leaders from, from various aspects of, of that. I'll ask them to, to introduce themselves rather than read all the names out. You do have them uh, already in the brochure. But uh, Brian, if you'd like to start us off. Hopefully the uh, microphone works there, perfect. And um, so yeah, I'm Brian Holiday. Um, I, I'm an executive management board member for Siemens here in the UK and I lead the digital industries operating company. Um, my background is very much computing uh, and control or automation technology. Uh, I guess you all know us as an organization for our footprint in industry, energy, healthcare, and uh, in infrastructure. Um, but we're also, uh, of course, a, a manufacturer. We have somewhere uh, in the region of 200 factories globally, um, and we'll have 15 here in the UK when Gould comes on stream um, uh, in the near future. And of course, that means that we also are, uh, like many of you, uh, looking at Industry 4.0 and what does that mean for us in, in our manufacturing locations. Um, I, I trust, too, that we'd also be seen as a, a bit of an innovation partner or an industry partner, because I, I guess with Industry 4, one of the interesting things is I it's an ecosystem, uh, and, and I, I hope we contribute beyond our own commercial interests, not just in terms of the, the services uh, that we might bring to market, but working together with some of the organisations represented here to today, the High Value Manufacturing Catapult uh, with Make UK, which uh, Stephen uh, represents, of course, and, and the Made Smarter pilot that we'll hear a little bit more about. But also, um, you know, the education topic, of course, is one that we uh, recognise is key to Industry 4, um, working uh, not just with schools and colleges, but we with universities to try and unpick the education next steps that we need if we're to benefit from uh, a developing fourth industrial revolution. So for me, top topics, um, productivity and unpicking that, that Steve, you've mentioned already. Um, you know, low levels of adoption of automation, trying to understand why that's a, a thing uh, in the UK, uh, and really how do we benefit from the emerging uh, opportunity of, of Industry 4.0. Very good. Um, good morning. Um, I'm Stephen Phipson. I'm the Chief Executive of Make UK, which some of you would have known up until a few months ago as EEF, or the Engineering Employers Federation. Um, the largest membership body in the UK for manufacturing. We've got about we represent about 20,000 manufacturing businesses across the UK. Um, and if you take those together, that's about a million employees out of the 2.7 million employed in this country. So a real national body, been around for 120 plus years. Um, and we, it puts us in a unique p position. We're able to talk to thousands of different manufacturers, get a real sense of what the challenges and opportunities for those, those companies are. And as an organization, we deliver services as well as represent them at government. And uh, at government, we um, have weekly meetings with the cabinet, so we're able to really put the case for manufacturing every week to the government. And actually, m in many respects, whatever we do in terms of surveys with our members, whatever we do in terms of surveys with manufacturers in general, the number one issue that always comes up at the moment in particular is not Brexit, it's skills. Skills are the number one issue. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about skills in some detail, um, not only what we're contributing, but what we see on the bigger picture, and also some of the, some of the really good s case studies that we've seen recently about companies gripping this issue, but more generally, the scale of the challenge that we have to make sure we are fit for this fourth industrial revolution going forwards. Thanks, Stephen. Um, good morning, I'm Donna Edwards, I'm MD for Business Support and Business Finance at the Growth Company in Manchester and also Programme Director for the Made Smarter Northwest Pilot. Uh, that pilot um, is being delivered in partnership with the Northwest Local Enterprise Partnerships uh, and their associated growth hubs. Um, and our interest in this, as Brian has alluded to, is the low number of SMEs that are starting to look at digital uh, as a way of improving productivity uh, and upskilling their staff. So our interest in that is what are the triggers that will get SMEs to engage and start to do things differently and how can we learn from those interactions about how services need to be delivered uh, to give SMEs the confidence that 
this is something that they can do and should do, and it's maybe not as scary as they think it is. The language can be off-putting, so how can we, through the pilot, identify what the messages are and the things that we need to do that will get companies confident to take that step forward? Um, so Made Smarter is there to facilitate that process, working with SMEs, suppliers of solutions to those problems that they've got, um, and also to make sure that we have a legacy that moves forward, that hopefully it's not about a Northwest pilot, this is about how we engage SMEs nationally to actually get the rate of adoption increased much more quickly. Yeah. Uh, Paul Bartu, I'm a professor of uh, advanced manufacturing uh, at the University of Manchester. I'm the, the head of the manufacturing group and uh, I'm leading the Industry 4 initiative and uh, I'm also board member of uh, the Digital Futures. So in our case, uh, of course, uh, training is the key, the key aspect. Uh, we are uh, trying to identify new routes uh, to prepare the employees of the future because they need to learn new knowledge. And uh, we are thinking about the universities of the future because universities need also to adapt to the, to the new world. Um, knowledge, innovation, uh, knowledge translation, uh, it's also a, a critical, a critical issue for, for us. And uh, as Donna mentioned, uh, particularly in uh, supporting SMEs uh, also to overcome some of the, the, barriers, uh, the barriers for them uh, in terms of um, uh, implementing uh, uh, industrial digitalization. So uh, knowledge transfer, innovation and uh, uh, training are the major uh, aspects. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ian Fennell. I'm the chief executive of ABB in the UK. Um, we have around 3,000 employees in the UK and about seven factories, manufacturing a range of um, industrial digitalization technologies globally. We are a leader in industrial uh, digitalization and also in energy. Also very uh, much a global leader in e-mobility. Um, and, uh, and you may have seen we're very much a B2B type organization, but our profile has been raised recently with the the joining up with Formula E. So, so we are the global sponsor for, for Formula E. I think one of the challenges that I'll go into maybe in slightly more depth later on is really to do with the productivity puzzle in the UK. We are behind the curve uh, in productivity. We're behind the curve in adoption of um, um, automation technologies in general uh, and, and robotics uh, uh, in particular. And we are a large manufacturer of, lo of robotics. And, and, and that, for me, is critically important for UK PLC. The European project, whether we're in or out of that, is, is, is nothing compared to the productivity issues that we have as a country. And I think adopting, and uh, back to Donna's point, the lack of adoption or trying to get companies to adopt uh, automation technologies is, is vital to the economy. Thank you, everybody. So um, I think as we're in Manchester, it would be appropriate to... Uh, to look at the Northwest pilot of, of this, uh, the Made Smarter initiative. And maybe, Donnie, you could you give us a, a, a perhaps a flavour for the audience who may not know exactly what the, the Made Smarter and the Northwest pilot is and, and what, the, what the next steps that you're looking to, to achieve with that. Okay. Um, so the pilot um, launched um, two SMEs um, on the 2nd of January uh, this year um, with the purpose of getting... 3,000 small and medium-sized manufacturers in the Northwest to actually engage with the service. So effectively, we will offer SMEs an independent review of their business uh, to identify where there are opportunities for them to digitalize and do things differently to help improve their productivity. Um, we know through other services that we deliver that that's a challenge. People don't know what they don't know. And actually, how do we talk to SMEs in a language that they're going to understand rather than in jargon? Um, so first things we've learned are the big campaign went out with, this is your industrial revolution. Um, that absolutely does not resonate with them at all. Um, and it's more around profitability, improving your bottom line. How do you get more throughput <coughs> for the products that you've got with the kit that you've got? And how do you understand what's going on? So we've had to simplify, and we've learned that very quickly in the first three months, um, that we actually need to change the way that we're doing that. So the pilot ambition is that we will get 600 of those 3,000 SMEs to actually do something. 
That could be a leadership and management program because part of the problem is there are technical people in these businesses that have ideas, but they're struggling to actually get sign off to do anything differently because as they're trying to get the finance sector and the chief exec to sign it off, the barrier is they don't actually understand what they're being asked to do. So how do we work with leaders of those organizations to get them comfortable with the change that will come and the benefits that will come of them adopting some of these technologies? We have a team that we're recruiting that are specialists in you know, various industry four themes, but they are coming out of industry. They've worked in manufacturing, they've been there, they've done it, things have gone wrong, they've had to put them right, so that they can go in and work quite intensively with those businesses for around 10 to 15 days over the lifetime of the pilot, which runs till March 2021. Um, to actually give them the confidence that they do something that works and they can do something else and they can actually go on a journey through this process. It's not you have a, an intervention and in 12 days it'll all be wonderful and work. We all know it doesn't work like that. You plan, you do, and then something doesn't work and then you have to go back and review it. So hopefully we'll fund 480 projects um, of a 50-50 funding so the companies have to put some funding into that. Um, to actually work out what works and how we can get those companies to do that. We've also included student placements as part of the pilot. If those SMEs don't know or don't have the resources to look at what they could do, then we're going to work with the universities and other people who do student placements to put them in for 12 weeks with those SMEs to identify projects that they could consider implementing, uh, which gives work experience and hopefully provides jobs for some of those students as well who came out last year and still haven't found work. So it's quite a round package um, of identifying their needs, having somebody they can go to if they get stuck, so a, a, a mentor almost, um, and then we will track through the productivity improvement because for the 20 million pounds for the pilot, government would like 150 million uplift in productivity and GVA. So that's that's the chestnut at the end. That's great. That, I mean, that's, that's a really important initiative. Yeah. Uh, I know many of the, the, the panel are also en engaged with that. Yes. Perhaps, um, Brian uh, and Ian, if you would give us your perspective from a, uh, a manufacturer and a technology provider and how you engage with that, that project. No, certainly. I mean, perhaps to uh, just make the point that I, I think it's tremendously important that we... Um, you know, have this, this active intervention. I mean, I guess we, we used to have a manufacturing advisory service which small companies could go to and, and gain expert insight. And, and I guess since the demise of that, we, we felt it in the industry. Um, and so I'm delighted that we've at least had this, you know, the sign off to, to start this journey. Um, and I think, Donna, you, you've already picked up on some of the key points that, you know, for me are important. You know, how do you create a conversation where the two parties are talking about actually solving problems, uh, not just the technology? Um, and I think actually, um, you know, the pilot is, is helping us all, you know, come together to sort of think about some of these challenges. Um, and I think it's an exciting space to be thinking about finance, starting up, you know, bringing expertise together, solving problems. And, you know, as a technology company, I think, you know, we're, de we're delighted to be part of that. And, and we see that, you know, there's an opportunity to participate beyond our commercial interest in, in trying to to help, um, you know, get to, to some of those underlying uh, challenges, which, you know, are leadership and, and technology and, um, you know, sharing best practice where we've seen that happen, you know, bringing some of our expertise and exposing our factory, for example, to uh, some of those organisations that are, have put their hand up and said they want to take a first step. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean going giddily at digital technologies. It may mean using digital technologies to help improve what might have already been started, a continuous improvement journey. Uh, and, and in that sense, looking at productivity and competitiveness. And I think working with experts, having experts that we know that we can go to independently as part of that conversation, I think will be tremendously value adding um, in, in helping us uh, make a bit of progress in the Northwest. Yep. And I think uh, to Brian's point about uh, taking that first step, the, the first step is always the most important one and, and the most difficult almost. And our experience uh, with working with, with any organization is, is once that first step is taken, there's no going back. And whether that is in any form of automation or deployment of robots, that first step is clearly important. But I think from a technology point of view, there's, there's a few sort of fairly uh, key points. The technology exists today. This is not something that we are 
um, uh, that's in the R&D pipeline. The, the technology exists today. It is being deployed around the world uh, in, in every manufacturing scenario that you can imagine. Um, it, it is typically scalable. So, the, and, and I would always encourage, I think, the first step to be, to be modest. There, there are uh, lots of examples out there where, where companies, and I was talking to one just a couple of days ago, who built a brand new factory, not in the UK, and went for the big bang approach, and it was a complete disaster. It, 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 is, it, is, it is important to try and, and, and automate step by step by step, and those, that modular approach to, to automation, I think, is, is extremely important. Uh, the Big Bang approach with IT systems, with big data, is, 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 is a very, very difficult thing to manage. And I think uh, also the, the AI is, is, is clearly the next frontier. Go out into the, into the hall there, you'll see all sorts of stuff that is related to AI. It's a very fascinating place to be, but that's really the next step beyond automation. And I would encourage at least m uh, modest steps into the technology piece first before looking for the Big Bang approach. So, um, Stephen, you mentioned skills mm. uh, as a very important issue, uh, and the top question I've got on the on the app at the moment is: uh, Do you think technology is advancing quicker than we can upskill? How, how do you see that from your? your you've got a, a broad membership. You get a lot of feedback from from your members. Uh, how, how how do you address <coughs> that issue? Well, it's it's it is by far the biggest challenge if you look at it in terms of, of skills. We've got um, the estimates at the moment show us out of the 2.7 million. If you think about the community of uh, employees we've got in this country, that the upskilling requirement over the next five to five to eight years is around a million people in that community will need to change skills and change uh, the sorts of um, jobs and job titles they are doing. So it's a very, very significant challenge. I think there's a couple of really important points here, though. First of all, government is absolutely committed to help with this. And the reason they, and we have to keep in mind why government is so keen on this, is that manufacturing in this country, even though it only represents 10% of GDP, is 45% of our exports. And 85% of what we do in terms of business research and development investment is in the manufacturing sector. So to keep us competitive is really at the top of the agenda. And I can tell you that really is a cabinet priority for any flavor of government that comes in over the next uh, next few weeks probably, the way things are going at the moment, but whatever happens, it's absolutely a priority for this country to keep us competitive. And the issue at the moment is that we're not competitive. When you look at the other big initiatives that in China, with China 2025, or Make America, or Industry 4 in Germany, we're slipping behind there. And if you look at one of the main reasons, and the government does a lot of benchmarking on that, it's because of the skills base. It's because of the technology diffusion, getting people involved and understanding it. Um, if I could, maybe just a, one example to, uh, to illustrate the point. We've worked Please. obviously closely with many companies. There's one in particular, has around 2,000 employees, and makes advanced electronic manufacturing systems in this country. Uh, a well-known brand, but I won't mention them because they haven't given me permission to mention them. And on the last 18 months with them, we've been on a journey to digitize some of their manufacturing operations. Um, and in particular, they brought in collaborative robotics into one of their production lines. Back to Ian's point, slowly but surely, take one part of the factory, digitize, and, and use that. And they found many issues. One issue was the workforce were worried about losing jobs because they're automating. At the end of the process, they doubled their employment. And we'll come back to why that was. Uh, the second point was they, they said, we didn't realize what, what sort of skills we needed to analyze the data that was coming out of these production lines to make it optimum and to productionize it properly. And in fact, the chief exec said to me, you know, we couldn't even write the job description. We just didn't know how to do it. They, they actually worked closely with their local university to define the sorts of data analytics and new job titles that did not exist in that. And I can tell you that factory has been there for 30 years doing this work. So they're pretty good manufacturers, but they had to have a completely different approach in order to optimize. They, they more than, um, they, they, they multiplied their productivity by four times by, this, by the implementation of this production line, employed coders that were in the video gaming industry to help them with data analytics to make the best use of what they were getting from, from all the data sensors on their production line. And as a result of being more productive and more competitive, they increased substantially the employment in that part of their factory. So 
it's a very big shift that people don't appreciate. If you can do it properly, it's an extremely beneficial thing to do, which is why the government is so intent on investing and helping manufacturers to do this. But the root of it is around knowledge, technology diffusion, but skills, and skills is critical. And at the moment in this country, many of our skills programs, like the Apprentice Levy program, um, are focused on the skills of today, not these new skills that we need for the future. So there's a lot of work going on with government about how we redefine that. There's an announcement recently about their um, reskilling initiative. It's a very loose initiative. Government's not too sure about how to define that properly. They need lots of input from us, from manufacturing community, about the sorts of new skills they will need in this new world. So it feels like we're at the beginning of a journey, I would say, Steve. It's, it's that sort of feeling about it. Um, and there's a lot of contribution that we can make to forming those new skills initiatives going forward. But the good news out of all of that is that government is committed to it. So uh, they just need information from us about what we require to make this as successful as possible and get us back up that list of competitive nations in this, in this new race to digitization, I think. Great. Thank you. Paolo, yeah. I think there's a natural uh, <laughs> movement to, to yourself as, a, as a, an, an educator and a provider of, of skills, uh, I'm sure, uh, both at uh, people who are beginning uh, their careers, uh, but also perhaps those who, who, who are already in their careers and need, need changes. How, yeah. how, how, how do you... S so, we, we have, I think, uh, two different types of challenges. Um, one is a, a short term. So, industry, uh, some SMEs, they, they don't understand technologies and the potential of that, these technologies. So, in order to address this, what... Uh, at least at the University of Manchester, we, we are starting to do is to create a Industry 4.0 Innovation Lab. So this is something that uh, will happen in a very short uh, period of time. It was uh, something that we proposed to the university and it was approved. And the idea is to bring uh, SMEs to the University of Manchester and mix them with uh, colleagues from different faculties, trying to address their challenges. And then we will select a couple of projects and we will provide seed funding to develop those projects. So this is a, a, a mechanism to address these short-term uh, uh, problems. Then we have uh, long-term challenges. So we need, uh, as a university, we need to prepare and to train the employees of the future, uh, addressing industrial needs. And in that case, I, I, I strongly agree with uh, what was uh, discussed in, uh, in Davos quite recently, that uh, universities should not uh, teach the world as it was, but the world as it will be. Uh, so we are, we are trying to do that because uh, besides uh, technology, we need to develop in our students uh, new skills, so leadership, uh, uh, flexibility, adaptability, because they need to adapt to a world in a, uh, profound technological and social uh, transformation. Um, industry 4 is also associated with the concepts of uh, mass customization and mass personalization. So universities will tend to address also issues like personalized uh, learning, um, addressing uh, individual aspirations, needs, interests uh, of our students by offering uh, a wide variety of programs um, and uh, and learning experiences. And finally, there is a, there is a big potential here also for uh, a strong collaboration between universities, uh, industry, uh, councils, business organizations, um, which is the concept of uh, uh, field labs, uh, real life uh, uh, training platforms uh, where universities and uh, other stakeholders uh, collaborate uh, to uh, provide a real training environment to our, our students, preparing them to the future. So there are lots of opportunities also for, for us uh, uh, in this field. Great, thank you. Um, I'll take another question from the app, uh, which is uh, also getting lots of likes. Um, so I'll read the question out, and then I might rephrase a little bit. So do you think the closed nature from suppliers of technology is, supply is slowing down adoption? Uh, a lot of these systems are amazing, but they don't work well together. So that's the question. I, I might put to that the, the question of, is that what's happened in the past, and is that still the future? 
Um, I don't know, perhaps Brian and Ian, Ian, Ian want to an answer that question. As technology suppliers, it seems that it's, it's targeted it. No, I <laughs> suspect <laughs> so. No, I, I guess with a background in industrial communication, perhaps that there's one um, example where what, what we've actually seen, if you think about how technology's developed since, I want to say, roughly the uh, early 90s, uh, which, you know, a, a lot of automation technology or industrial technology then was proprietary. You know, every vendor had their own driver for their piece of technology. Um, we, we, you know, we had to program explicitly connections between technologies and control systems, for example. So we've already seen a huge amount uh, done to open up, um, for example, industrial communication standards to, to you know, standardize the way that we connect technology uh, into control systems. And, and one example of that is supervisory control and data acquisition systems. You know, they can communicate with anyone's control system through um, technologies like OPC. So I, I think, you know, as consumers, of course, we absolutely expect open standards. We saw that through the 80s in the, the, the market for personal computers. Um, and that expectation is one that we take to market today that, you know, we, we have to operate in an environment of open systems. So I think working together uh, as much as we possibly can um, on open standards is key using uh, the available technologies, which are now low cost and ubiquitous like cloud, um, using the standards within that. Um, you know, I don't think any manufacturer is in a position to design uh, proprietary technology and bring that to market. But, you know, for us, we work with IEC 62443 standards, for example, when it comes to the encryption of data um, that we, uh, we put onto the cloud. We'll work with the OPC Foundation for transmitting data at, at volume in real time uh, between systems. And we'll use open standards like Profinet, which means that you can, you know, connect a variety of devices um, to the control systems as well. So I, I absolutely agree. I notice we've got a, a cybersecurity question coming up, but all of these things, uh, open standards and, and cyber, uh, necessitate a degree of working together and, and focusing on uh, harmonized standards for the future. So I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. In your perspective? Yeah, I think I, I, I <coughs> agree with that. I think um, if, if you look at what, uh, certainly the, the strategy that ABB took three years ago now, was uh, in in the whole data piece was to was to do we build our own systems or or, or do we partner w with with others uh, whose core business it is and and um, you know Brian mentioned cloud services so 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 we have a global joint venture with 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 Microsoft for the provision of cloud services we have a, a joint venture with HPE for edge computing uh, IBM for Watson and so on and so on so 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 we rely much more now on on working with experts to to adopt and adapt uh, their technologies uh, into our applications uh, vice versa uh, in order that the systems by almost by definition are open uh, if you go back 5 10 15 years yes everyone was writing their own bespoke systems and and there may have been standards but those communications didn't work and, and there were there's so many examples of, of, of these uh, communication systems that were supposed to be open uh, or supposed to be designed to a particular standard that actually didn't communicate with one another. And I think the provision of cloud services these days where, where you collect data from a device into a control system, into the cloud, uh, it is the clouds that communicate with one another and then back to the individual devices. So I think it's not that the problem's gone away, but I think it is, is fast becoming history. And, and I guess just on to the uh, cybersecurity piece, I mean, clearly that, that's one of the concerns that everybody has um, about the, their data. Uh, they, they, they want it for themselves. Maybe some companies are not sure why they want it, but it's their data and therefore they, they, they don't want to give it away. Um, and we understand that. Uh, and, and data is, is, is high value these days. And, and that's one of the reasons that we, the, from an edge computing point of view, we actually engaged with uh, HPE in order to be able to do analysis of customers' data in customer systems, so that the data is not given away. Thank you. Um, Stephen, perhaps you, you talk about from your perspective of, of your manufacturing members. Um, clearly, that, that, that question there, I think, was, was raising one of the potential barriers to adoption, which is the feeling of, of uh, you know whether whether the systems are open or, or closed or not, but perhaps you talk us through some of the other things that you've discovered in, in surveys. You, I know you've done in, in yeah, identifying sure. what the we've barriers done. to adoption are. We, we've done a lot. For, I mean, lots of barriers. Perception is one, and uh, particularly on the SME agenda. So the perception that you need to spend a lot of money in order to make your factory is one where 
you know, we, um, by far the majority of companies are SMEs in the manufacturing community in this country, uh, and actually um, showing them that you don't have to. For £800, you can equip your CNC machine with sensors, which uh, if you can analyse the data properly, within a month you can double the output and productivity from those machines. And it's amazing what you can do at a very low cost. And I think showing and demonstrating those kinds of technologies is really what Made Smart is about and about uh, this, this pilot here. And can you really get people engaged to change their perceptions about it? That's one issue. Um, back on cyber, which is a recurring theme, it is a major problem for manufacturers. Um, in fact, we're talking to the National Cyber Security uh, Centre for Government about how we might do something on a national managed service basis for smaller manufacturers. The problem isn't tr traditional cyber security um, in terms of your financial systems, which are generally okay. Insurance is available, banks will help you with it, all that sort of stuff. It's not that that's the problem. The problem is as you digitize more and more, and some factories have seen this, um, you end up with lots of other links into your factory for things like online maintenance schedules when, you're, when, you're, uh, when you've got an integrated network running machines. Um, third parties coming into your system digitally, like even solicitors and lawyers and things like that. Um, and when you have all of your critical process data stored on these, in these devices, um, for other nations which have got an active, active uh, program of uh, trying to suck out that IP from countries like us, it means that they're quite exposed. And those systems are not very well protected in this country. And there's a real recognition of that. So can we play a part and help in, in working on a national managed service for smaller companies that's low cost and helps them protect their particular um, IP is critical. Uh, but talking to companies about that is absolutely vital and reassuring them about what is available is absolutely critical. So worry about that. And then, of course, back to the first point, it's about skills. I mean, some of these job titles, people don't, everyone knows what a production engineer and a CNC setter is, but a predictive analysis engineer, how many people have got one of those in their factory? Not many, but if you want to take full advantage of this going forwards, they're the kinds of skills that government needs to help us to create for the future. So the skills base as well, Steve. Obviously. Great, yeah, thank you. So, D Donna, in your, your experience so far with, with the pilot, uh, are, are these things all resonating with, with what you're hearing, uh, you know, the, the barriers to adoption, cyber security? I've got a question on cyber security, for example, is how, how much is that considered when we talk about Industry 4? Uh, are we introducing new risks? So are, are these things that you're seeing in the pilot as, as issues to be addressed? They are issues to be addressed, and I think we're seeing a large number of the companies we've engaged with so far. It is all around data and data processing, sensors online, how do the, you know predictive things um, being implemented, and obviously data security is part of that conversation. Um, you know, and who you link with to make sure that that's thought through when you're talking to suppliers of solutions. Um, you know, but working with people like Innovate UK. Um, and the larger manufacturers, then this then gives reassurance to the smaller companies that there are places you can go and have these conversations, but it's having it at the right level so it doesn't scare them off. And I think that, you know, we don't start at the point you need to protect all of that. It's about what you can do and these are the things you need to do to make sure you do it in the right way, and that is about securing your data. But a lot of the barriers are around people think this is going to be expensive, um, that they're going to get sold a solution that's not right for them. So part of the pilot is around defining what they actually need so that they can then go and procure the right solution to solve that rather than, I've been told I need that, but then it doesn't join up with anything else. So right. we'll start them on small projects. Some people have started a journey but don't know where to go next or how to connect up different processes. Um, so it's about joining those dots and making sure that there is a strategy in place to take them forward so that they move continuously in the right direction rather than it's all piecemeal, um, you know, and the firefighting. Then, right, deal with what the issue is and then how do you take that forward? But money is definitely an issue around, you know, this is going to be expensive, we're not going to be able to afford to do it. Well, actually, it might not be as expensive as you think it is, but what we're trying to do is hold events and sessions in manufacturers' sites where they can see what people have started to do. That you know, They've then got a peer group that they can talk to. People are building connections, and rather than one-to-one -one solutions, how do we then get to a solution that then solves problems for a number of organizations? Right. And that's where we're working with some of the larger 
BAA systems, for example, in terms of how do they work with their supply chain? You know, they have a vision of where they're going to be in 15 years' time, but they need that supply chain and probably a supply chain that doesn't exist yet um, to actually help them do that. So how, through that mechanism, can we also get the one-to-many solutions where we get better value for money um, and it becomes more cost-effective as well? So, yes, we'll deal with individuals, but actually we need to deal with groups of people to actually get the volume of change that we need to happen. We won't do this one by one by one. It needs big groups of things to happen right. as well. You, you raised a really important point, and, and Paolo also mentioned uh, the, the, the being able to demonstrate and show yeah. the art of what's actually possible. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that's, that's part of raising awareness of just what, what, what is possible, who else has done it. What yeah. Is that part of the, the pilot, is to be able to, to, to have sort of case studies or sites yes. that can be visited and... and therefore demonstrating yeah what we will want with the people who are engaging with the pilot is um, we would like them once they've started on that journey to actually become part of the, the the tool bag that we've got where we can take other people to see what they've done um, and it's about demonstrators universities have demonstrators catapults um, MTC in Liverpool so there are places you can go to show people what could be done yeah um, but they don't know about that and you don't know what you don't know. So how do you make this simple uh, and actually get the conversation going in a language that they understand? So the more we all talk, you know, whether we're large, small, medium sized, we start to use the same language. Then people start to believe that this is going to happen rather than they'll sit back and wait to see if it might. This is already happening and we need to get them to the table much more quickly. Great. Thank you. I've got another question. Uh, which I think probably is related to, to Paolo. Um, so what do we need to do differently with respect to our children's education to ensure we're ready to lead the world in industry for technologies? So I guess that's, that's right from primary school, secondary school, before they come uh, to, to a university or, or through perhaps through an apprenticeship route, uh, either through university or directly just in, into a career. But what, what, do you, what are you seeing when, you, when you're getting people uh, in w are there things that need to be done differently at the school level before they get to get to your level? Um, no, I, I I'm very surprised with um, with the, nal the knowledge of, um, of digital technologies that our our students uh, have when they they start uh, their university programs. Um, they know about these technologies. They know about the use of uh, of uh, of these technologies. What uh, they don't have is uh, other skills, other relevant skills. Um, so in a, in a company, they are not going to work in silos, so they need to communicate with other, with other persons. So this communication, social skills, leadership, creativity uh, are fundamental. And they must, uh, they must uh, uh, be trained for problem solving. Um, so this is, uh, I saw a, 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 a question, will the university have a, a, an important role in the, in, the, in the future of manufacturing? And uh, for sure, uh, university will have a, a, strong, a strong role. And I think that we will see more and more uh, a strict collaboration between uh, universities in, and industries. So currently we have uh, generic programs and uh, in the future I think that we will have more tailored programs prepare with uh, specific sectors or specific uh, specific industries addressing their challenges. Yep. Brian, you want to come, come in on that one? Just maybe um, to also signpost a piece of work that's being undertaken in this uh, space. I, I mean, I'm delighted, first of all, that Paolo, uh, you, you uh, uh, also recognise that the need for creativity um, in students that come to universities and then on to employers. Um, but Robert Halfen, the, the former skills minister, is now chairing the Education Select Committee looking at education and the fourth industrial revolution. So it's available on parliamentary TV, and it's worth a quick peek. Um, I did get the chance to contribute to that briefly, but I equally um, uh, concur with your point that what we need in the world of work are people who can come along with communication skills, intuition, you know, creativity, um, and underlying interest in, in technology. And there's a danger in education that we focus overtly on knowledge acquisition and that that has to change we're setting our kids up to compete with computers if we if we don't and i, I think there's recognition of that but it you know turning turning the handle on that seems to be a, it's difficult and a bit slow yeah. 
Stephen, you... Yeah, I was saying, um, obviously, the school's agenda is a critical piece of this mm. whole puzzle. So we have this monthly meeting with Damien Hines, the Secretary of State for Education, uh, where we talk about the needs of manufacturing and what's going on in the education system. The, the, the problem we've had is there's been an overt focus on measuring schools by how many people they get into university. And so the whole system's been designed around that. You'll know that on the curriculum in this country, D&T has been taken off the curriculum for the last 10 years. So uh, many, uh, when, we have, when I go to our apprentice centre, uh, and we have 2,000 apprentices in, the, in Birmingham, in one of our uh, national apprentice centres, I ask them why, they do, why they're apprentices. And one of the main reasons why these kids want to come and do apprenticeships is because at school they couldn't do anything practical. They weren't able to use their pragmatic skills at all because the whole system is designed to get them to university. The other problem is when you get graduates going to university and coming back into manufacturing, many of them don't want to do the things we want them to do. They want to go and do, be managers and they want to be top-end engineers. They don't want to help us in terms of implementing technologies on the shop floor. That's a very different matter. So we need to have an equal amount of focus on getting people at those what we call level three, level four skill levels. You know, people that are very good pragmatic engineers that can work on the shop floor and actually make things instead of just managing things uh, or designing things. It's really, really important. And I sense a real shift in that. So we're now seeing on this year's review of the curriculum that DNT is back on the school's curriculum again after a lot of pressure from us and others around that in manufacturing and really trying to change the way people are encouraged into... Apprenticeships are always seen as a second best after going to university. If you can't go to university, do an apprenticeship. Uh, the public perception of manufacturing is still largely Victorian type, um, dusty old, dirty uh, manufacturing sites and not the modern environments we have nowadays. And so we have a role to play, you have a role to play in engaging with schools, with parents, to make sure the perception of this sector is changed. Because at the moment, in all of our surveys publicly, which we do with, uh, with GovUK, we see quite a, a poor perception of the manufacturing sector. It's not something I'd like my kids to go into unless they, don't, they can't find any other thing to do. And we should reverse that, as they do in other European countries, to make it a profession that everyone's proud to be part of. Great, thank you. Yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Paolo. Yeah. Yesterday we, we had a very interesting discussion with, uh, with colleagues from uh, different universities, uh, different countries, and uh, one of the conclusions was that uh, we are spending too much time teaching and students spending little time learning. Mm. Uh, so we need to change this. Mm. Um, another important point, uh, because the world is changing very fast, is uh, life learning, uh, lifelong learning. Mm. Uh, which, uh, which is really, really important. Um, yeah, so, so it's not just uh, straight out of school no, but it's thing. Continuous. It's, it's lifelong and yeah. It, yeah. it can be reskilling or it can be going yeah. back to, to study specific yeah. problems. Yeah. Donna. Yeah. I think one of the things that we've discovered with, you know, a, a large part of the people you need to be able to do this are already in employment. Mm -hmm. um, and some of the companies we've been talking to who have started on the journey, and we said to them, so how have you found um, the people to actually help you create that sort of 4.0 area in your factory. Uh, and they have all come from the workforce that they already had. And these were people that were doing things in their own time with technology and, you know, computing and gaming that actually they found a lot of the skills were there, but they weren't being able to apply them at work. Right. So, you know, there are people already in those organisations who are interested in this, who are actually are welcoming the opportunity to now be doing something different. So, you know, it's going to be a mix of people coming in to help people who don't have that, but where you've got a reasonable sized workforce, you'll probably find there are people that can help you do That's this. That's really important, it's spotting them. the hidden talent yeah, in your organisation. and you, yeah. you know, they come in, they do that job, and you forget that they probably do a whole raft of other things outside work that they could apply at work. Um, so we're seeing some of that come through in those conversations as well. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, Ian, I'd like to come to some, something you mentioned earlier. Productivity is a really important uh, subject to address. Could, could you give us an idea of wh what is the productivity challenge in, in the UK w and why the UK compared to other cu countries? Um, it's, it's a great question, and, and, and one, wonder, one wonders whether or not there's, there's a, an element of a cultural barrier almost uh, in, in the UK to, to, to delivering this productivity puzzle. And, and, and maybe some questions, uh, I, I guess, maybe to challenge the audience here, because this is a, a first-class audience to, to, to really get some feedback on. But, but for me, there's some urban myths around automation. 
You know, one is that it's too expensive, and if you take Stephen's point, you know, you, c you can get sensors in a machine for a few hundred pounds. You can automate a production line for a few thousand pounds. The payback in automation typically is less than 12 months in, 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 in most businesses. It depends on the scale and scope, of course. So, so it is not as expensive as, as most imagine. The, the skills piece, Donna's point, I think, is first class. The, the whole skills piece is it's a both and equation here. You've got to start in primary schools and get the curriculum right so that you can deliver Paolo the, you know, the right sort of student uh, intake. But it's also, you know, that's not going to solve the productivity puzzle today or tomorrow. That we, you need to deploy the skills that you already have and are working with you and know your organizations first and foremost. And the deployment of automation in our experience with lots of SMEs is it releases skills into the workforce. If you deploy automation, you retrain those skills and you grow the company. And there's so many examples. Stephen's example earlier on is, is, is a really good example and that's our experience for most SMEs. So, you know, if you, if, you, if you employ a robot, you don't have to sack workers. And on the contrary, most of the organizations grow their business and look for more people. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, is, is about the complexity of automation. There's a perception out there that the whole automation piece is too complex. So when a company comes along and installs automation in a production line or s installs robots and then disappears off, what happens when the stuff goes wrong? Well, there's, I mean, certainly from our organization, I'm sure Brian's exactly the same. There's so much support available from organizations like ours because clearly you want to make sure that this works and there could be maintenance contracts, there could be training programs in order to get local schools uh, up to speed with the technology that has been deployed. And with Made Smarter as well, th there's so, m so much advice out there to organizations who want to deploy that. So the productivity puzzle for me is, is it's almost like a six-piece kid's jigsaw. It's not that complicated. But, but my challenge, I guess, to, to all of us is, what really are the barriers to adoption? Is it because we don't know what we don't know? Is it, is it a financial barrier? Is it a technology barrier? Is it, is it you know, simply, I'm, I'm, as an SME, I'm too busy trying to win orders to keep my guys busy, and then I want to dispatch them and, and you're, you're constantly on that treadmill. And, and how to break out of that, I think, is probably one of the challenges and one of those pieces of, of, of the jigsaw. Yeah. So I think the challenge is for all of us. Made Smarter is, is I think, a, a for me, Made Smarter has to work. There's no other show in town. I, I sit on the National Commission for Made Smarter and also on, on uh, Donna's board for the, for the Northwest Pilot. And, and government, as, as Stephen said, the Secretary of State is right behind this. He wants to put more money in it. He needs to see the evidence coming out of the Northwest Pilot. But there is no other show in town. So for me, it absolutely has to work. And that's why we are passionately, passionately supporting the Northwest Pilot. That's great. And I know the fact, the fact that this room is full uh, of people who are, are engaged. Uh, you know, you, you obviously everybody who's because come here, here are the, the <laughs> ones who want to find out more and, and, and get stuck in. So that's yeah. a good sign. Stephen, you wanted to... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. The productivity thing, of course, many people have got an opinion on it, but there's a, there's a very good piece of work which Treasury and the and London School of Economics has been doing recently about the last 25 years in this country and comparing us to continental Europe in terms of productivity and what's happening. And you know, the sort of, the sort of central line is the financial crisis around 2008. And if you look at the difference between the UK environment and the rest of Europe, Europe's environment in terms of manufacturing, in this country we have a uh, relatively high cost of capital, but very, very high flexibility in terms of staff. If you look at continental, you, Germany, France, Italy, um, very low cost, in fact, big incentives to invest in manufacturing, but no flexibility with staff. You have to keep your employees. In fact, as we know in Germany, the, the, the government will step in if you don't have any orders to make sure those skills are retained in those factories. So consequently, up until the financial crisis in this country, we got our productivity and we kept pace with most of the Europeans at that stage 
by outsourcing to low-cost economies. We could get rid of people. In fact, I remember the government, when we used to go on missions with, uh, trade, trade missions with the government, you know, they'd sell the UK to other countries as a place to invest because we had incredible flexibility of labour laws. You can hire and fire whoever you want. It's not like being in Germany or France where you have to keep hold of all this labour. And that was our sort of mantra. So relatively high cost of capital, so not a great incentive to invest in the latest technology. But the way you can stay productive is by being flexible with your workforce. Take them on when you need them, get rid of them when you don't need them, outsource to China, to Vietnam, which is what we were doing up until the financial crisis. After the financial crisis, we saw an influx, if you look at the national data, of people onshoring again. It wasn't so easy. Um, we did reach the end of the line in terms of outsourcing to cheaper economies, but we were still stuck with a relatively high cost of capital, and we hadn't invested in our workforce because we didn't need to. Whereas in the continental countries, of course, they had had years and years, decades, of every, you know, keeping someone for life in their companies, meaning, meaning that they had to constantly invest lifelong learning in the latest technologies. So if you go to a German factory, you'll see you know, a lot of very mature workers, but with the latest skills, because they've been invested in relentlessly, because the management teams couldn't get rid of it. There was no flexibility of labor there. So the alternative is you invest in your labor, which is what they've done. So two things need to happen now, and this is where the government ha is changing, although we are still promoting the UK as the most flexible labor market in Europe, and I think uh, Mr. Fox needs to change that, but that's another issue. Um, we need to be investing in our workforce now, and this is what this is all about in terms of education, upskilling and changing. We understand the scale of the challenge. Government needs to support that, but government also needs to change the environment for investment in manufacturing here to make it really an incentive to invest in these two types of new types of automation and new types of processes and, and, and technologies that we need to remain competitive as a country. So we need to go through a complete mindset. The trouble with the leadership challenge in terms of productivity is that we have grown up with generations now of managers and leaders in that previous environment. High cost of capital, maximum labor. How many times have you heard it at a board meeting? Well, let's dump costs, let's get rid of people, let's reduce it. You'd never hear that in many of the continental alternatives. You'd hear about investing in the latest technology and using capital in a different way. So uh, that's part, that explains yeah. part of the challenge, I think, Steve. It's quite, uh, one of the themes of this panel, which I didn't necessarily expect, is that we've talked so much about people mm -hmm. and very little about technology. <laughs> and and that's, it's clear that, that really is the most important yeah. thing in, in our businesses. Ryan, you wanted to... Well, just to, just to build that. on uh, Ian and Stephen's uh, excellent points, um, I think for me, I mean, whilst it, it sucks being told by the Financial Times that we're 20% less productive than France, you know, I think we have now understood um, some of those links. And I think there's a strong correlation. We've, we've understood through Made Smarter that if actually we only deploy roughly 30 industrial robots per 10,000 workers here, uh, and, you know, that number is roughly 170 in, in Germany, that, that, that difference isn't just explained by the fact they've got a larger transport equipment sector, that there's, there's a, um, you know, a long history of investing in the technology that augments human effort um, in factories. So I think understanding that correlation and having a Made Smarter program that helps on the adoption side has to have a link, a positive impact on, on productivity. And I think we understand that better now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, we have run out of time. I'm oh sorry I didn't get to all the questions. Well done for putting them all, all through. Uh, I, and, and I was going to finish off with the last question for everybody to say, what's your last bit of advice? But we, we have run out of time. Uh, I think that the whole thing's flown by. It's been great. Thank you very much for, for, for all of your contributions. Um, so perhaps I would say uh, the last bit of advice to everybody is either catch these people at <laughs> some point in, during the day or their stands out there. I think, uh, you, you've all got stands, I believe, in, in within the place. So there is still opportunity to uh, either engage that way uh, or any of the questions that we didn't unfortunately get time to answer, uh, perhaps ask them. Of course, there's the rest of the day and tomorrow where we'll go into more detail. Uh, so we've given, a, a, I guess, a flavor here of the, the types of topics which are important, uh, but there's going to be lots more opportunities to ask questions throughout the rest of the day. So uh, just remind me to thank my excellent panel for your, for your brilliant participation today. Thank you very much. And uh, the audience for your excellent questions, which helped uh, make it fly along. So a uh, quick round of applause for everybody there while we swap over. Thank you. Thank you.